This is part two of the Bataan Death March story as told through the drawings of Ben Steele, a Death March survivor. In part one, the background of the Death March was presented detailing the conditions and events preceding the surrender of the American and Philippine troops and the beginning of the march back up the Bataan Peninsula. The Bataan Death March story has been told in movies, in print, and in harrowing first-person accounts. This video, too, is a Bataan Death March story, but it's unique in that it tells the story using pictures and drawings made by Ben Steele, a Death March survivor. Some marchers had a way of resting one leg by shifting their weight. Generally, it was not noticeable, and they could slop off and rest a bit. But if they caught you at it, it meant a butt stroke with a rifle or a beating over the head. And the people that fell down and didn't get up, you'd hear a shot fired, and you'd look back, and there would be a body laying behind you. Prisoners were attacked for assisting anyone failing due to weakness or for no apparent reason whatsoever. Strings of Japanese trucks were known to drive over anyone who fell. At night, Japanese riders in vehicles would casually stick out their rifle bayonets and cut a string of throats in the lines of men marching alongside the road. But they wouldn't let you go back and take care of downed troops, even at the artesian wells, when the prisoners would break and run for the water. They'd shoot indiscriminately into the crowd, and some got shot and laid there. You couldn't go take care of them. Men were dying of thirst and were very desperate for water. If the troops broke ranks, the Japanese wouldn't tolerate that. Regardless, if they saw the opportunity, prisoners would run to the side of the road to get some water. And along the side of the road would be caribou wallows, which were puddles of water that the caribou had used to wallow in to keep away flies and mosquitoes. And the Americans and the Filipinos both would actually lap up that water like a kitten would lap up milk. And of course the water was contaminated. In this way, many of them became very ill as a result of drinking such water. The captives were given very little to eat. On the third day, they were fed a scanty cup of rice. When Japanese troops were not too close, captives on the death march would break ranks to go into the sugarcane fields to get cane to eat. If they were caught with the cane, a prisoner might be beaten or killed. The final destination of the Bataan Death March was Camp O'Donnell in central Luzon. The marchers finally reached the town of San Fernando where they were forced to begin a 10 kilometer walk to Camp O'Donnell. At Camp O'Donnell, 2,000 American soldiers died within six weeks of imprisonment. Only about 54,000 of the 75,000 prisoners reached this destination. The death toll of the march is difficult to assess as thousands of captives were able to escape from their guards. All told, approximately 5,000 to 10,000 Filipino and 600 to 650 American prisoners of war died before they could reach Camp O'Donnell. On arrival at Camp O'Donnell, the Death March prisoners are told, first by a Japanese officer and then by an interpreter, 
what they have to do to survive in the camp. The Americans were used as slave labor in violation of the rules of war. Many were placed on burial detail, digging graves for their fellow prisoners. Approximately 2,300 Americans died and were buried at Camp O'Donnell in the first six weeks of inter internment there. In this drawing, a soldier is forced to dig his own grave. Perhaps he tried to hit a Japanese guard, or he possessed Japanese currency. He digs the grave, and they bury him in it. The sick and the weak were not cared for. They were left to die. The only medics were those who had been captured, but they had no medicine to give. The, quote, hospital, unquote, was where people were sent to die. Instead of increasing rations in the hospital, they were cut in half. Men worked with 106 degree fevers so that they wouldn't be admitted. You could smell the stench of the dead whenever you were anywhere near the hospital. It seemed that dying was the only way out. Over 50 Americans and 500 Filipinos died each day. Inside Camp O'Donnell, the men were crowded beyond belief. 1,500 men shared each water faucet, and a single rat would be a meal for 20. Water became a very scarce commodity, and getting on a water line was quite a feat. They would shut it off after a certain length of time. So many of the men totally went without water. This is the end of part two. To continue, go to part three.